Hello, and welcome everyone to the Globe Summit. I'm Anna Kuchmint. I'm the Boston Globe's health and medical editor, and I'm so pleased to be joined today by Dr. Rochelle Walensky. Dr. Walensky was head of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention from January of 2021 until June of 2023 under President Biden. Prior to that, she was Chief of Infectious Diseases at Mass General Hospital, where she conducted influential research on HIV AIDS and is a leading expert on virus testing, prevention, and treatment. She currently serves as a Hauser leader at the Kennedy School. Dr. Walensky, welcome so, welcome. Thank, Thank you, you very so much, much for Thanks joining for having us. Me. I'm delighted to be here. So you served a relatively short tenure as CDC director for just under two and a half years. I'm wondering what led you to leave in June of 2023? Oh, wow. Well, so maybe short in duration, but long in infectious threats. <laughs> we, we had quite a few. Um, you know, I uh, was called unexpectedly um, by the administration in the middle of COVID. Um, and was asked to step in for a position that I, I never really applied for, never did apply for. And, and part of what led me there was sort of my desire and duty to serve. Um, we were losing three to 4,000 people a day and someone called and said, please come and help. Um, my job there was really to sort of right the ship of the CDC to get us out of the pandemic, at least as I saw it. And by the end of, um, well, by May of 2023, um, the end of the public health emergency had happened. We had tackled MPOX, another public health emergency that had ended. Um, and I really sort of felt like um, it, was a, it was a really hard time, probably, I hope, the hardest thing that I will ever have to do. Um, and I was also understanding, having never served in the government before that election season was happening, was about to come upon us. And I am a doer. I wanted to get stuff done. And I knew that there would be challenges in the election season and health was about to get even more political. And so I feel like, I felt at the time that I had done what I had come to do and um, that it was time for me to leave. Okay. So having, having seen the government response from the inside, having led it, having also observed the CDC, worked with the CDC from the outside. How prepared do you think we are for the next pandemic? Um, maybe just from a vision from inside, I will say the CDC is 12,000 people, 12,000, an additional 12,000 contractors. We work across the country and in 60 other countries around the globe. Um, the business card says 24 seven, and that is when people are working. They truly are there to tackle infectious threats and public health threats that you, so that you all don't have to worry about them. Um, when you look at where we are as a country in terms of public health, I knew that the public health system was a frail system. I did not really recognize how frail it was. And I think you and the public hear about public health issues when the infrastructure is not strong enough to support them. And that's what happened with COVID. I can tell you plenty of public health issues that we tackled during my tenure that I suspect are not on your radar. Um, but what I really learned about the public health infrastructure is how deeply frail it is. And when I think about infrastructure, I think about it in sort of three major buckets. One is workforce. The second is data systems and data integration. And the third is our laboratory systems around the country. So if you just look at workforce, studies have demonstrated we are about 80,000 public health workers in deficit across the country. And that was before the pandemic. And there's been actually a rather large exodus or anticipated exodus after the pandemic, especially of our young people in public health, which means our pipeline is really at risk. That's a workforce, real workforce challenge. The second is our data systems. Now, I will tell you when I got to CDC that we received data by Excel, by email, by the cloud, by fax machine. Those, yes, those are our data systems in this country. And when people have said to me, why did we have to use Israeli and UK data for our vaccination data? The vaccination data are in the public health system. Hospitalization data are in the healthcare system. And they don't talk to each other. 
And I called many hospitals and said, can you collect the vaccination data just so we have it in one system? And they uniformly, reliably said we could not in a reliable way. So we have real challenges with our data systems and the integration of those data systems. We are now in a place where Epic can talk to other Epic systems, but Epic can't yet talk to Cerner. And that's just in our healthcare system. So now how do we integrate that into public health? So we have real data challenges. And we did receive money through the American Rescue Plan and other things to try and um, modernize our data systems, many more of those investments need to happen. I, I think single counties could use the budget that CDC got for the country um, in terms of modernizing their data systems. And then the third is our laboratory systems. Um, and I don't know how many of you have been to our state public health lab, which is a great public health lab, but it is not, and, 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 and many states don't have the public health lab like we have here. And yet, it is not of the highest technology, many of our states, I shouldn't speak for Massachusetts, but many of our states don't have the technology. You know, everybody's talking about wastewater surveillance and genomic sequencing. And not only do you need the technology in order to be able to do that, but you need the technologists and the informaticians in order to inform that. Um, and so when I think about the infrastructure across the country, if we want all of these things, we have to invest longitudinally, long-term investments. I call them disease agnostic investments. We can't have a budget line that says, this can only go towards COVID. This happened with MPOX when we said, you know, we, CDC had a tiny little budget for MPOX when we had a huge MPOX outbreak here in this country. Um, and yet we couldn't mobilize resources, braiding them together because MPOX wasn't yet a, a sexually transmitted disease, so we couldn't use STI monies. So there were a lot of different ways that we need to have our resources disease agnostic so that we can pivot and use a really strong foundation in all of public health. I also wanted to um, ask you about vaccina vaccination rates. So routine vaccination rates for children ticked down during the pandemic, and they've yet to rebound. New CDC figures um, just released this morning show that um, flu vaccination rates in adults are also down, and only and uh, new survey data um, just out shows that only one in four adults plan to get the updated COVID shot this fall. So what, how concerning are these trends and what do you think is behind them? Um, so first and foremost, I plan to get a flu vaccine and a COVID shot. <laughs> I, probably next week, actually. Um, just so everybody's, everybody knows my plans. Um, I, let's break it down, actually, to pediatric vaccines and adult vaccines. First, I will say that countries that did best in the pandemic are those that had trust in their government. And when their government said, get vaccinated, people got vaccinated and had high vaccination rates. If we look at the pediatric vaccines, we saw during COVID a trend towards um, decreased vaccination rates and that people have not caught up. There has been a trend for increasing rates of exemptions from vaccination. So we have um, over 10 states that have exemption rates of over 5% for their pediatric vaccines. We have five states that don't even have 90% coverage. And so while on average we have about 93% coverage of entering kindergartners in, PD, in um, children for all vaccines, the problem is we have like pockets of differentiation. So if we're 98% in Massachusetts, some other state might be at 85% or 89%, and that is just simply not enough to combat and produce a sort of immunity wall for some of the threats that are out there. That's the pediatric side. Um, and when we have tried to strengthen those and worked with states to try and strengthen those or decrease the number of exemptions, quite sadly in my mind, states are actually moving in the other direction. If we open this can of worms, we will have fewer restrictions, not fewer requirements, not more. And so um, they're not quite open to, to that discussion in many places in the country. Adult vaccination, I actually think, is a different challenge, um, a similar challenge, but a different one. In, pedi in pediatrics, we have in this country what's called a Vaccines for Children's Program, or VFC, and that is how children, insured or uninsured, can get free vaccinations wherever it is they go for all of the recommended vaccines. We do not have a similar program for adults. We have 14 recommended vaccines for adults. And among the many reasons, and probably the biggest factor for adults not getting vaccinated is we don't have insurance coverage for them. Um, and so if you look at differential vaccination rates by insurance, that is among the challenges. Now, there are other challenges in terms of 
disinterest and people not who have insurance not wanting to get their vaccine. I saw another statistic this morning we were discussing that only 18% of adults have gotten a shingles vaccine, have gotten both doses of a shingles vaccine. I practiced medical care for 25 years, infectious disease. When you see an adult with shingles, let me tell you, you are very motivated to get a shingles vaccine. <laughs> um, so that's another plug. If you haven't gotten your shingles vaccine and you're eligible over the age of 50, please do get your first and second dose. But what I will say is is that part of this is sort of laissez-faire, I don't think I need it, I'm sort of refractory to vaccines because I'm done with this stuff right now, I just don't want to talk about it. And some of it really is, um, some of it is I think a victim of our own successes, right? Um, many adults have not seen the ramifications of what happens when you have a measles outbreak or a pertussis outbreak because we've been fortunate to raise our kids in an era where we haven't seen them. Mm -hmm. I also saw in the survey that some adults actually fear the side effects, and that's why they're also staying away from vaccines. Mm -hmm. What do you think can be done to, to shore up vaccination rates and just shore up trust in public health in general again? Yeah, you know, the trust in public health, the trust in science, I think this is a real issue. Um, it's also, you know, as I look at when people say, what are we going to do about trust in public health and trust in science, this is trust in our public infrastructures, this is trust in government, this is kind of trust in our neighbors, trust around the board is really lacking. Um, you know, that said, we have a reasonable amount of trust in our public health systems. I don't know if that water is tap water that you're drinking, but if it is, it shows that you have trust in public health, right? So, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, like, there are systems in public health that really are working and that people believe in. The vaccine one was fraught over this last several years, and I think that this is going to take to get our vaccination rates and to, to deliver 700,000 vaccines, which were delivered and administered during my tenure, um, we, that was an all-out effort, huge amounts of media, people, you know, sort of talking about it all the time. And it is not, you know, that is not what people are talking about right now. So we need to continue to do that. But it can't just live in the public health sector, in the medical sector. We had, we had businesses helping, we had NGOs helping, we had, it was a population-based um, effort. And the effort that, the responsibility has diminished now and is now just simply in the public health sphere and it has to really be a broader effort, in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you about, about bird flu next. Um, as you know, an outbreak of bird flu has now spread to 231 dairy herds in 14 states, and it's infected about a dozen agricultural workers, plus one unexplained case in Missouri. How concerned are you about the strain of bird flu, and do you feel like the response has been enough to contain it? Um, so in 1918, we have an had an influenza pandemic, and people anticipated we would have another influenza pandemic 10, 100 years later. We didn't get an influenza pandemic. We got a COVID pandemic, um, which does not mean we are not going to get an influenza pandemic. And so what I will say is the bird flu outbreaks are concerning. It is not just concerning that we have had so many among flocks, but what we are seeing now is a transition to, um, to cattle. We have only a handful, a dozen cases that have um, transmitted to humans that we can document. And part of that is because the receptors in humans for this strain um, don't, don't bind the strain tightly enough so that um, it's easily uh, trans, uh, transmitted to humans. But uh, influenza has the capacity to mutate and influenza has the capacity to mix such that if somebody who was infected with seasonal flu and bird flu at the same time got infected, they could mix and create something that could be really problematic. So um, I don't sleep great at night knowing that there's more bird flu out there than I would like. I do want to plug the efforts of what happened in Massachusetts, I think, last week. You all reported on this. And that was the first state among all of them to go to 95 licensed um, herds and screen all of them in collaboration with the um, Department of Agriculture, um, Public Health, and the Broad Institute, and, and with a plan to do that monthly, so that we know that those herds have no um, have are, are bird flu free. 
Um, you can imagine that is challenging to get everybody to do that in a given state, and I'm really proud that Massachusetts was able to do that. And we need to sort of highlight that as an example and set the example. The incentives, you can imagine, are not lined up for cattle owners in, to do that, to come forward and sort of say, please come screen me. And that really does have to be an all of public health response. And I really do hope that Massachusetts can set the, has set this example and that others will follow suit. Thank you. I just wanted to, um, to tell everyone that you should submit questions. I have an iPad right here waiting for questions and I'm happy to ask Dr. Walensky if you're in the room, you can scan the QR code on your tables. And if you are out there watching remotely, um, you can submit your questions online. Um, so I did uh, also want to talk to you about COVID. So COVID seems to have become normalized to the point where this summer, when we even when we had a huge surge this summer, well, not huge, relatively big surge compared to previous summers, people weren't taking precautions, people weren't testing, they were kind of going about their normal lives. Is that, is that okay? Or should we still treat COVID differently from influenza, from the common cold? Um. Look, we now are in a place where most people have seen COVID or a vaccine to it once, twice, three times, out to getting a test to putting your mask on is to protect somebody else and I think one of the reason one of the things that really kind of went sideways in this pandemic um, and especially you can understand that when when people are so scared and there's so much fear is that we forgot to protect my neighbor and I think we are kind of back to those ways of forgetting to protect my neighbor I'm gonna take um, a question from our audience um, if bird flu becomes a pandemic, are there any learnings you would apply from the COVID pandemic to improve outcomes for the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, I look, may it not happen, right? But I will say that there was so much work that happened during COVID that we, like how we set up mass vaccination sites, how we were able to do federal vaccination sites. Um, we have mRNA now, so like potentially can develop new vaccines in, in ways that were not possible, you know, 50, 60 years ago. Um, we have learn, you know, our data systems are stronger than they were. We still have more work to do. I think that, um, you know, one doesn't want to have this happen so quickly. And yet, um, we learned a lot in all of our infrastructures, in all of our, all of us had incident responses and incident management teams that really flexed deep muscles as to how we would tackle this and, and have after action reports that sort of say, these are the things that we did well, these are the things that we need to learn from, we did this at CDC. Um, and we created partnerships. Now one of the things that, um, and, and I say that because public health needed to work with communities, hospitals needed to work with community, businesses, there were all these partnerships that formed. Sadly in my mind, the, there were not continued resources to continue to foster those partnerships. Um, when I was sitting as ID chief um, early in the pandemic, I can't tell you how many companies said, can you loan me an expert? Um, those questions are, are gone now. People, those companies are not looking for experts anymore. But I do think that we, there is a role for medical expertise in all of our areas so that we can actually couple and work together because we will continue to have threats, whether they are bird flu or COVID or MPOX. Um, it is helpful to have somebody on your team who can sort of help rally the troops in these areas. Thank you. Um, here's another question. In our health in our healthcare delivery systems, we have alarming rates of burnout. 
You mentioned concerns about the public health work workforce. What systemic changes would help both? Um, well, I, you know, I actually just, I just spoke about this a couple weeks ago in our healthcare workforce and some of our challenges in our healthcare workforce. You know, among the things that really needs to happen in healthcare is, first of all, we do not have enough physicians and doctors and, um, and uh, APPs, um, allied professionals, to serve what we need right now. We have a retiring piece of our medical workforce. We have incoming residents who are working less um, hours by law than the people who retired when they came in. Um, we have sicker patients who are coming in the hospital, and we have more we can do for them, which means they are demanding more medical time. Um, and then we have, um, you know, we have challenges. The, the current workforce who is here trained during COVID um, and never got, in my mind, what I call diastole. They never got the relaxation after their training to sort of say, like, we really, we valued what you did, we recognize how you stepped up and served, and, and it just kind of continued. I am really hopeful that, um, I, I don't, I say this reluctantly because AI is not the panacea, but I re am really hopeful that at least some of our AI systems will be able to help some of our efficiencies to, to help with the burnout. You know, among the challenges in burnout are um, doing work, you know, prior authorizations is talked about a lot in burnout. Um, uh, note writing and billing is talked a lot. And these are all systems that I think AI can very much help. So I am hopeful for at least some of those systems to be in place. That's great. Um, in the case of outbreaks like COVID, communities of color are disproportionately impacted. What are some learnings and hopes for how we can address this? Um, this was such an interesting period during my time in um, at MGH and then what happened in the transition, in my transition. First, I, I just want to remind people, and this is so true of all of infectious diseases, this is what we do and what we see all the time. COVID came to our shores here in this country by people who traveled on airplanes and traveled on cruise ships. And then it went quickly to the most vulnerable, right? That happens with infectious threats all the time. And so we have seen this over and over again. My career was in HIV AIDS. That's happened there as well. Um, and so we really need, do need to anticipate that these disparities will exist. They do exist whether or not we're looking for them. And so then the question becomes, how do we address those issues? One of the things that happened immediately when I got to CDC is we as an administration recognized those challenges and then um, really worked to address them and wanted to make sure that those socially vulnerable populations were getting to access to vaccines. In fact, we had a social vulnerability index that we used to decide where we were placing our mass vaccination sites. They only went to places that had a high social vulnerability. Um, we did that by intention. That said, after decades of being marginalized and not having access to care and not being involved in clinical trials, guess what happens when you say, we're gonna give you this vaccine first? There's a trust issue, right? And so just at the time where you're really dedicated to wanting to do the right thing, you can't immediately make up for decades of challenges. And so this is going to be hard and long and require a commitment from all of us to enroll vulnerable patients in clinical trials if they're eligible and want to, ensure their access to care, cont uh, con continue those commitments to working within the communities, and um, some of those melted away after COVID, and those have to continue if we're going to be able to address another future pandemic and have those populations engaged in, in, um, and willing and wanting to participate. Thank you. All right, one last question in our last minute. Um, you know, of all the infectious diseases that you've you know, kind of battled in your career, you know, what keeps you up at night the most now? <laughs> like on September 26th, <laughs> the, or 5th, the um, election. <laughs> um, and, and I say that somewhat lightheartedly, but, but also just to say um, I'm not a particularly partisan person, and I really strived in my tenure to not be partisan. My goal was to deliver health to people. I don't care how you voted. That's how I've always practiced medicine. Um, that said, 
there is someone who is running who we now have a documented record is not taking evidence-based science in a way that delivers health, and that concerns me for whatever our threats are in the future. So that I do, I, like, if we're gonna do evidence-based science and deliver the health that way, I'm good, and I'm not really partisan, but we have a history where that may not be the case. Um, the other thing, sort of, I think where you really wanted to go with this was, um, we now know that 75% of novel infections are coming from the human-animal interface. They're zoonotic infections. Um, if you've ever been to a wet market, you know that human-animal interface is real. And um, so we, we are not done with new and novel infectious threats, and they will continue. The final thing I will say um, is the day before anyone heard the word SARS-CoV-2 or COVID, the world was worried about antimicrobial microbial resistance. And um, that nut has not been cracked. It got worse during COVID. Guess what everybody with COVID got? Antibiotics. And so we had a massive use of antibiotics during our COVID, um, during our COVID period. And um, almost all of our benchmarks that were really hard earned over the last several years to address antimicrobial resistance got worse during the COVID outbreak, so the COVID pandemic. So we have a lot of work to do there too. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Walensky, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for joining us and tuning in online for the Globe Summit. We have plenty more ahead, so please continue to, to tune in today.